Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. We are doing a follow-up episode. Okay, so part two, how do I bring up wanting a consensually non-monogamous relationship? The practical stuff. Here we go. Okay. I want to just follow up. This probably will be a shorter episode, although I say that. We There's a lot up. Who could of not, practical could details, but let's see. But we talked about creating a culture of talkaboutableness. But what the heck do you talk about? I kind of didn't get to that part. Okay. So apologies for not getting to it, but that is, it's a huge, huge topic. So let's say you're in a monogamous relationship right now. And you want a consensually non-monogamous relationship. I think that there are some things to think about very early in your contemplation process. One of them is, what are your reasons for being monogamous? Like, why have you been doing it this way? Was it a conscious choice? Or had you never been exposed to the idea of consensual non-monogamy? Um, what, what was going on? How did you wind up in the relationship you're in now? Um because you and I had very different experiences. Yep. You eschewed monogamy very easily and early. Yeah, I was just straight up iconoclastic. Well, that's what everybody else is doing. So I'm also not going to sign up for that. <laughs> also, known as a fucker. That's true. I... <laughs> so I came at it from that point of view, as well as the, the experiential, okay, yep, my wife had a relationship with somebody else for years and we knew about it. We didn't talk about it, but not because of the non-monogamy because we didn't talk about stuff like that in our relationship you didn't talk about at all. the sex you were having nope. with her with her that, that's right so why would you talk about the sex she yeah, was having with it, someone else it wasn't specifically because it was uncomfortable because it was non-monogamy it was just that's how our relationship went so we so we did know what that, that about our relationship to start we don't <laughs> talk about stuff and so my experience was sort of i i had the shock and awe version i found out that that several of my friends were in, in, in the friendship group that I was in, it I found out that a bunch of them were swinging or, or having, I don't even know. They were having relationships. There was lots of extracurricular wasn't activity. It was as monogamous as it might have looked It was way outside. not. And and the, the thing is, I thought that that was something that only happened in movies. I was very naive in my 20s, like really naive. I never really had a drink until I was in my 30s. I didn't smoke pot. I just didn't, I just did, I just had babies every two years and- homeschooled them and I it wasn't because I was particularly religious or anything I just it's not like you're wholesome I, I wish I could disagree no I don't even wish I could disagree <laughs> it's true I'm not no I these things just never occurred to me as yeah. real things like I love watching porn but I didn't think any of that was real I liked watching stories where people were doing these these creative arrangements and I loved watching soap operas, but I didn't, I didn't know that real people were doing this. And so all of a sudden one day I found out that I had friends who were having non-monogamous relationships. Boom, fireworks go off. My brain now has a whole new island. Non-monogamy island is uh -huh. now, <laughs> has now been um, established. It's an outpost and I'm curious. I don't know what that means, but I was curious and that meant that in the background, just because of how I work, in the background, I started thinking about what that meant. I started contemplating, how did I wind up here? I had a marriage where I wasn't getting the sex I wanted. And that was that was widely known. That wasn't just known to my husband. That was known to just like anybody who would listen because I complained a lot. Um, so is that um, the beginning? Of, so you were saying, so what does talk about mean? Yeah, what do you talk about? What, are these are the things that you started talking about. These like, are the oh. things that I started thinking about for okay. myself. And right. these are the things I see my clients come in and they're like, they've started contemplating like, wait a minute, or maybe they've read a book or maybe they've seen a TV show that introduced an idea and started just to think, how did I get here? 
what set of rules and and like imagination led me to have the relationship I currently have? Now, who did you talk to about that? Anybody? Who did I talk to about that? Because I know that you think and you like to talk to people when you're thinking. Yeah, I did talk to some people who are, who shall remain nameless, okay, but sure, were part sure. of that original circle. Mm -hmm. There were conversations going on. In fact, I had conversations with, oh, a dozen of those people. And, and then I started having some conversations outside of that. And I heard a lot of the same thing. Well, sure, that's fun, but it never works out. Mm -hmm. It never works. 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 Yep. Never works. Never works. Never works. It's like a little thing. chorus. It was like a little bird chirping chorus. And the thing about me is when somebody tells me something doesn't work, <laughs> I just get curiouser and curiouser. What do you mean? And fast forward another, I don't know, eight or nine years. And I was defending my oral um, exams. And um, I wanted to talk about polyamory in my, in my dissertation. And one of my professors said, that never works. Oh my. <laughs> and I laughed. I love this professor. He's a delight and he's so intelligent, but he just said it. And as soon as the words came out of me, I was like, I am going to own these exams. And I did because the very premise of it was flawed. What in the world are we talking about? When we talk about monogamy working, we don't look at the divorce rate and say, well, monogamy clearly doesn't work because 50% of relations of marriages end in divorce. 75% if it's your second marriage. We don't. <laughs> so what does it mean to work? So what does it mean for something to work? I love monogamy. I think monogamy is awesome, but it pisses me off that people decide that there's only one way for us to relate mm -hmm. and anything else doesn't work without even investigating. So my curiosity is and what as a me. as a not very good one, but as a scientist, the I like drawing that inference from that. OK, here's my statement that never works. I'm going to ignore the fact that there are billions of people on the planet, which means there are uncountable combinations. We can't say that it doesn't work. There's too many different kinds of people into too many different kinds of relationships to have. For the audience's record, you were saying you find yourself to be a poor scientist, not me, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, no, you're a great scientist. No, I was talking about me. No. Even thinking, me as a poor not... scientist can see this. There we go. Oh, so after you've started looking at what the heck your relationship actually is and how you got there, I think the next question is what do you actually want to be different yeah start increasing right. your imagination and this is where i would say yeah right there right at these beginning stages is the time to go ahead and start um it's like teasing the idea yeah it's, um playing with it yeah playing with the idea of like what what exactly is monogamy what are we doing and and might there be something else now if you're in a relationship where your partner has no clue. The bottom line is there's never going to be a good moment for this. There's never going to be a perfect moment. But um, the perfect moment is when the two of you walk into a room and both at the same time say, so what do you think about non-monogamy? <laughs> there it is. Okay. That's the perfect moment. That's the dream. Don't, uh, don't, don't, don't hold wait your breath. For that, though. So when you're in this beginning stage and you're starting to think about what you wish was different, a lot of people assume that the thing that every consensually non-monogamous person wishes was different is the sex. That everybody's thinking about that. I talk to dozens of people a week who are CNM, and that is just not the case. It, it's just not. Yes, lots of people care about sex. Yes, I care about the sex. But that's not the core foundational reason that I that I see. It's not what we see in the research. That's not the 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 driving factor because relationships are much more complicated than just sex. Even relationships that are just about sex are more complex yeah, than right. just about sex. So getting clear about what it is that you wish was different in your relational agreements. Which starts with understanding what it is now. Yeah. So what is it now? What yeah. do you wish was different? The um the next question or the next thing I want people to consider is, are you currently in a place um, yourself to find enjoyment in your partner's experiences 
of being out there, of having other lovers. And it, do, you, do you feel ready for that? And if you don't, are you ready to start facing that and, and, and really looking at yourself? Because some people start off in non-monogamy with the idea that um, they're like a covert hope under the surface thinking I'll get to have fun um, and I'll either pretend like my partner isn't doing anything or we'll have a one-sided arrangement or I'll put limits on them in some way that will keep me safe and feeling safe and sound. All of those things suck a lot. Let's not do that. We can do better. Now, there is a desire. Of course, people want to feel a sense of security. And I work with people on this all the time. But if you're not currently in a place to find some enjoyment in your partner having a good time, and I don't even just mean sex. The, the sex piece can be really challenging. There are some, there are some things to... Um, some cognitive and some somatic tools that we can put in place to, to work on that. But like, if you don't even want them to just be able to swipe left and right, think about what exactly your motivation is. And yeah. if it's entirely one-sided, that's worth considering. I, I'm not a hundred percent certain that that's gonna, gonna go over really well because you're talking about Setting yourself up for disappointment if your partner has an easy time out there. Not not fun. Imagining into, you were talking about playing around with it. And imagining yeah. into, okay, so my partner is out doing, okay, imagine something. In detail. See how you feel. And here's the thing. Don't just start with the sex. No. Please. Start with them having coffee at a coffee shop or them mm -hmm. playing a game with someone or, or exchanging friendly texts or whatever, start imagining those things and see how you feel. Because often our covert control of our partners, our, our sense of entitlement to their being, it, it is subterranean. That is like yeah. running the oh, show yeah, underneath. Hard to, hard to keep track of. Right. So yeah. Imagination. I use active imagination all the time to try things out, see how I feel about them, to test myself. Yep. It's been incredibly valuable yeah. um, in helping me ask you the right questions. Yeah. Ask you questions about what you're doing. You're you're going on a date Thursday and and my imagining into your date lets me think about what's my stuff to hold and what's reasonable to ask you. And not like not ask you to like make me feel okay, but instead ask you questions that are about your actual enjoyment that are supportive yeah. of, of our actual values in this. Um, okay. So now let's get to the warning part. We're in the practicalities, right? Having a conversation about shifting from monogamy to consensual non-monogamy can, even though you may not mean it to, can feel like a threat to leave. Oh, Right. Um, I have that problem in small ways, just talking to the kids. I'll ask a question and the assumption is that there's something behind the question. Yep. Um, there usually isn't. <laughs> um, but you bring this up to a partner and it can feel like that. It can feel Absolutely. like there's like, something behind it. Like there's something behind it, some threat, um, yep. some, yeah. So this can feel like an existential threat to some people. Yeah. And so approaching the conversation itself with care is important. However, I want to say I've heard from plenty of people who say like, well, I could never have that conversation because um because that would, you know, that would kill them. I, they mean it facetiously, but and I think okay, so some of these people are are deeply hurting themselves. Like they're hurt too, and they're just swallowing that. So this is one of those places where we have to ask ourselves, are we more committed to growth than comfort. And so maybe it's time to backtrack a little, go back and have some conversations about what your purpose in your relationship is, yeah. and then revisit the non-monogamy questions after spending some time in this, what are we doing here? What is our, what is our individual why? What is our joint purpose? And then maybe you'll be in a place to make things talk aboutable and then walk through this. And so, so you can see how really the process 
it could take years for some people yeah. if they realize, oh, my whole relationship is unconscious. We're just floating along. Yeah, there could be a long time of talking and negotiating and trying stuff out and making mistakes and trying again because that's what it is to be that's alive. what it's going to be anyway. Okay. So, yeah, just have the conversations and who the things you're going to learn about each other and yourselves. It's pretty exciting. That said, um, that threat to leave, the way it can feel, mm. the shock that it could feel to someone like, whoa, you would consider what? Um, some of that is about a missed perception of who you are. So something else to consider is, have I been presenting myself um, sort of one-sidedly? So if you imagine yourself as this beautifully cut jewel or a multifaceted crystal, a beautiful, like beautiful crystal pulled from the ground. And it's just, just gorgeous, but it's so complicated with all these different facets. Have you only been showing um, one or two or a few sides of yourself, facets of yourself to your partner? Is that why this is such a shock to them? When I, I shocked see. my partner with the idea that I wanted to be non-monogamous, I have to say, while I feel bad about that, on the other hand, he wasn't paying attention. I had been dissatisfied and naming my dissatisfactions for years. And then when I found out that our circle of friends had a lot of non-monogamy going on, I was all kinds of curious to him as well. Mm. I was super curious. So I was sort of laying some groundwork in a completely clumsy and unconscious way. But I was laying groundwork that had he been curious, he might have seen more of me. He might have seen it. Wow. She really is more complicated than this. Huh? Wonder what that's going to mean. It's, um, if you've been showing yourself to be one person and trying to be this like super unified whole. And, and I like, did that. Yeah. Then, and, um, and, and it, it cut off conversations Yeah, because it cut off curiosity. Well, there's nothing to be curious about because I'm showing you everything that I want to show you. And when I've opened up with you and shown you all those different things, yeah, um, all of a sudden there's all these other conversations that can lead here, by the way, without you having to set it up. Right. Um, so it, it can just come up naturally if if you can share all these different facets. Right. Might, might not. So the thing is that our relationships, they're about learning together. Yeah. And so that's what what we're doing. And um, consensual non-monogamy specifically, I find that there, there's an unlearning and relearning process that happens because almost all of us were brought up in a, a society here in the United States. We're brought up in this culture that says monogamy is the way. That's the way, right? So if it's there's going to be stuff to have to unpack and unlearn. Yeah. And there's going to be stuff we have to relearn. And people move at different paces. We've talked about this in earlier episodes, but people move at very different paces. And so you may feel like you're totally ready to have this conversation and your partner may not be. And this can be an interesting spot to be in. How long, how long are you willing to be in that in between? Um, when I work with people who are transitioning into non-monogamy, I sign them on for a full year. We do at least a year because that arc of a year, you got to have some stuff happen. Stuff has to start to transform and change. It's important to imagine to be beforehand, to... but you've got to hold it up against the experience right. to find out. Stuff in your life happens. You go through holiday seasons and gift buying happens and and the exchange of, of um, like of times change and all of those things that happen help you understand the like the what it means to love yeah. as a verb yeah. right and what it means to practice the skills of of loving and they're not necessarily easy but you're going to have easier times and and harder times but also different partners move at different paces that's normal and so if we try to rush and say, okay, in the next eight weeks, let's both get on the same page. Let's both be ready and here. And that mm. may not be reasonable. Yeah. I, right? I don't know how I would estimate something like that. Right. 
So I, I like to think of a year and think about, let's move through seasons. Let's move through a, a, a whole cycle. Let's move through a solar cycle and like really allow ourselves to experience it at the pace we move at. While also saying, we're not just going to hold still. We're moving all the time. We're shifting. We're experiencing that. Um, it's also really important to note, and I'm, I'm certain that our listeners are aware of this, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, consensual non-monogamy doesn't fix anything. It certainly does not. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't fix anything. So just like having a baby doesn't fix a marrige. Um, it, no, no, it, it doesn't, is, it doesn't it, fix a problem. It can address, it can address unspoken needs. It can absolutely increase joy and happiness. It can become a huge catalyst for growth. But if what you're experiencing is some sort of profound lack of love and, and wantedness in your relationship, um, CNM is not going to be just a silver bullet that just magically like, boom, there, and it's all fixed. You're going to be developing skills to relate to each other um, on many levels and letting go of some of the old habits of possessiveness and illusions of security. A lot's going to happen. <laughs> it's okay if it's uncomfortable, but I don't want people to get into the idea that like it's going to fix something and then they're just going to be like, they're going to feel all better at some point. It really is going to be a process. It's not a fix. It's just another kind of relationship. Right. That said, um, when there is a fundamental, you know, disparity, differences amongst partners, I have absolutely seen, I've seen many examples where a, a really, um, a well defined relationship agreement and truly investing in, in each other's growth and, and loving your partner and letting go of the idea that your relationship needs to look a particular way and fit into the monogamy box. And it has to be that way, letting go of all of that and reinventing that, um, I think that could qualify as a fix, but it's not the non-monogamy that's yeah. a fix. No, it's, it's the, it's shifting into really, really conscious, thoughtful, active love. It's, it's shifting into like, what the, wow, what could our relating be? Yeah, which you don't need non-monogamy to do. No. So the other thing that I want to, um, to address before we wrap up is I, I've had people approach me and say, so I am, I have discovered that I am non-monogamous. And so this is, this is a deal breaker for me. I've discovered this about me. So my partner needs to either get on board or, or we're done. I, I like to bring this up because you absolutely get to have deal breakers and Remember that that can feel incredibly coercive, especially because there are likely power disparities currently operating in your relationship. Almost all relationships have, you know, a varying set of power um, around finances and time and and um, housing and all sorts of things. And so just throwing the idea of non-monogamy out and saying, so this is a deal breaker. This is me. And um, I, I have to have it and I have to have it exactly the way I want it. And I have to have it now is a lot. It's a lot to throw out and comes really close and definitely can be coercive. And so taking a step back from that and saying, I'm in a relationship. And so I may have discovered something about myself that is integral and important. And that doesn't mean that I have to have exactly what I want right now. Because we're okay. grown-ups. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it also it. doesn't mean sacrificing exactly what yep. you want right now. There is this, this uh, just nuanced mess that you've now entered into. And it's time to allow the change to, to occur both within and without. So 
how this looks practically speaking is I see people who say, okay, I've discovered that I'm consensually non-monogamous. I need to have sex with other people. I'm going to have sex with other people. I'm going to do it now. And it's, I, it is a recipe for disaster. Even if you wind up making the relationship all work out at the end, my experience, both personal and professional is that it is inherently manipulative and you're going to wind up feeling bad about yourself. So if you're the one contemplating that, I would just say it is a good way to give yourself a bit of a complex about, Oh, I'm, I'm kind of selfish. I, so, so I would recommend slowing down. So yeah. What do you recommend? So here I am. I've, I've come across the concept. My imagination is engaged in it. And I realize that it, it represents a part of me that I really want to grow. Yeah. What so now? what now? All of the discussions we've talked about, there are many discussions to be had. There is reimagining to do, um, engaging with a professional who can help guide you through a process of transitioning. Oh, that's a good idea. There's also ritual endings and new beginnings. Mm. So chapter 12 of Project Relationship, which is not a book specifically about non-monogamy. In fact, it's written from a pretty monogamous perspective. Um, closing out the relationship you're in does not mean ending it. Transitioning is a probably my favorite concept from all of non-monogamy. We've had several different kinds of relationships since we've been doing Oh, yeah. It. Yeah, we're definitely we on have... our fourth. Yeah. Our fourth relationship probably yeah i think our fourth like phase they yeah. it has it has changed over the 12 years we've been together fundamentally like monumentally enormous changes and those changes need to be marked yeah and, and acknowledged so acknowledged and acknowledged um it, like in a in a way that lets our bodies feel the closure. So a ritual closing in chapter 12, I lay out a template for exactly, you know, just like an easeful way to do this, a ritual closing and ending. And if you are transitioning, you would also pick up the new beginnings part. So there's a, there's a ritual closing for something that you want to end. And then there's a ritual closing with a new beginning. Um, and those rituals are what has made our relationship and the other relationships that I have had as well, because I've had several that have ended, gosh, just in the last few years, all of them have been, I've been able to transition through my grief process with more clarity, kindness to myself, because I ritually closed the relationship, even if the other person wasn't willing to participate in that closure. You still had a, uh, yeah. An event that you could look on. Oh, and, and on a, like a soul level, on a spiritual level, yeah. that has been profound and I highly recommend it. Um, if you're thinking about all of this and you're feeling overwhelmed, I, I definitely want to hear questions. I'm happy to address them anonymously here on the podcast. Um, but I also just want to offer that consensual non-monogamy isn't one thing. Neither is monogamy. Creative monogamy is a real thing. There might be a gray area for you in the relationship that you have now. Um, Dan Savage coined the term monogamish, um, which kind of means like, well, we're monogamous, but we're not going to like be kicking each other out if we're like having flings now and then, or maybe we go to a party once in a while. And some people have a creative non-monogamy that's as simple as you want to go out and and have somebody buy you a drink and flirt with you cool great do that and but you draw the line around sex or whatever. whatever your lines are it's it's about your individual experience make it what works best for your individual peoples yeah so the key to all of this is that i want people to be fully aware of how much autonomy and agency they have how much agency you have to create the relationship that feels delicious mm -hmm. for you and that is constantly growing and evolving and, and, and it's vital, right? It's like vivacious. It's alive. Yeah. And that can look a lot of different ways at a lot of different times. Okay. So hopefully 
this helped a bunch. We'll do another episode in the future about resilience skills mm -hmm. for consensual non-monogamy. Mm -hmm. um, and there will, there are also episodes about all this stuff that we've talked about, the relationship agreements and um, having these com these conversations and rituals for relationships. So there are yep. other episodes. If one of these topics felt like it needed a little bit more, you might head back into the catalog and look at those. And yeah, until next time, thanks yeah. so much for Keep listening. Keep talking to each other. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>